But um, before we have the pleasure of uh, listening to the, the project presentations, I would like um, to welcome, first of all, the global biomimicry network who uh, joined us today, and especially representatives from uh, Germany, from Italy, from the Netherlands, from the Austrian network, and also uh, from other global networks, especially from uh, the US. Before we listen to the students who are shown here already, um, I would like to also especially welcome the president of Biomimicry Germany, Arndt Pechstein. He is the project lead or a program lead and one of the major um, yeah, content um, creators and educators we have here. So um, I hope that Arndt is already with us. I am. Yes. Hello, Arndt. Hi, Fabian, um, and hello, everyone. A great pleasure to have you on this call tonight, or whatever time it is for you, depending on where you sign in from. Um, really great to have you all together here. Yeah, yeah, thank you for, for joining us. And um, so we heard um, the introduction and the background, why it is so important to change. And we, um, you, you perfectly outlined already the uh, pillars that can lead this change. And one of the central aspects is biomimicry. And we at Biomimicry Academy want to take this nature inspiration as a, a tool of facilitate this um, yeah, highly needed change that we want to see in the world. Um, I'm, I'm very happy that we had such um, dedicated and energetic students with us for the first cohort. And um, Maybe you can uh, give your impressions, Arndt, of uh, how you see the last yeah, nine months with these students. Yes, absolutely. So maybe first uh, to connect what we have been doing through the last nine, uh, like uh, basically months, and even before building up all these networks, is something that so much uh, gained relevance in the past weeks and months. If you look at the current situation, what is happening right now, this uh, like insane global lockdown, is uh, actually not a result of a virus, but a result of a flawed system. And that is something that we have been working on to basically create an alternative for a long time. And that is why biomimicry and bio-inspired innovation at large is uh, something that has a huge potential and will gain a huge momentum just now. Because what we're talking about right now in this crisis is really about how to adapt, how to create resilient strategies, how to be more sustainable. And going back to what we've just heard, in the uh, short input you have all seen is that we need a narrative we need a vision and we all experience firsthand and that is unique in almost like the history of humankind we all globally and collectively experience a possible vision of traveling less of being more at home spending more time with people reflecting on what is really necessary and having a sufficient uh, and not an efficiency driven life only. So this is something that really uh, basically creates an even bigger need for these bio inspired approaches. And that's what we've been doing also in this curricul curriculum over the past month. And what we've been observing was uh, like an, a cohort of extremely enthusiastic students who have been diving into two challenges that we will see and hear about uh, in, in a few moments. And uh, they were really coming from various fields from uh, different countries, different backgrounds, and immersing into two totally different challenges. So one social challenge and uh, like more uh, like, uh, like concerning society, one more technical challenge, totally different uh, aspects, and yet using the same methodology and really diving into first, what are the needs, what are pain points, what are requirements, defining the problem, then looking into biology for solutions, where we had amazing inspirational exchanges, where we had experts uh, and disruptors as part of the process to basically look into what are those principles and strategies nature applies and how can they be abstracted until they eventually came up with solutions. And that is so exciting because these things are actually projects that are not just made for the cohort and for the program, but these are real world problems and real world challenges that will continue to be worked on in, like in the future. 
And that is exactly what is uh, so important and where we put so much emphasis in our program and, and beyond in all the work that we do with the biomimicry network is to bring um, the ideas, the prototypes and the, the concepts we develop with biomimicry directly into application um, to not just keep it in the, in the theoretical realm or also in the ideal realm, but also to, to test it against the circumstances of the, of the market and of the uh, of society and of the world around us, because this is where it needs to have an impact. So, um, yeah, thank you very much, Arndt, um, for this reflection on the last month. And um, you stay with us for some, uh, for some more minutes here in this webinar. Um, to, uh, and to, and I'd like to invite you, especially, to uh, um, ask questions uh, to the to the participants, and um, yeah, address the challenges that they took on with their projects. And um, talking about this, I'd like to also welcome the challenge owners, which are Alessandro Villa um, and Diane Derby. Um, and uh, I'd also like to invite you, especially, to address questions. Okay, so hi everybody, thanks for being here. Our team is going to talk about fostering symbiotic relationships with bio-inspired innovation. And we focus it on museums and community creating lasting social value together. Next slide, please. We are Hannah, Renata, and myself, Sylvia. We are participants of the Biomimic Academy and we developed this project in conjunction with ER Museum. Next slide, please. First of all, we would like to take you back to the last museum experience you had or ask you about it. What was it like? How were you with? Who were you with, sorry? What was the most memorable part of the experience? Did you feel connected? And was it memorable? Next slide, please. With that previously stated, now I wanted to spend our challenge established that we are museums and the Biomimic Academy. It was to redesign the way a museum processes information from the public and vice versa. Here, we identify our key stakeholders by breaking down the challenge statement and creating a system map. In the statement, museums are identified as a stakeholder, but through our research, we determined that public could be defined into two similar but distinct groups, the neighborhoods and the communities. Next slide, please. Well, historically, museums have been defined as institutions that converts collections of artifacts and items of importance. Many public museums also make these items available for viewing, or that is mostly what are they known for. Our neighborhoods consist, they are individuals living between a defined geographical space near a museum, for example. However, communities are not confined by a physical or spatial unit. This means that communities are a mix of individuals and neighborhoods that exist locally, nationally, and even globally. They can interact through physical or virtual means. Next slide, please. Following, we did some surveys to understand more of our, stake of our stakeholder. Next, please. Next, please. Thank you. To our research, one last story. Renat. Thank you. Through our research, we found that many people had issues with this historical concept of a museum. These people are artists, curators, and decision makers in the museum hierarchy. They are also people with disabilities, members of virtual communities, and members of climate action movements, and more. The beauty of these interviews was that no matter with which community these people identify, they are always a part of several communities. For example, the creators are part of a neighborhood and maybe a part of a virtual community as well. In addition, they can take part in climate action movements. Thanks to this, thanks to this crossover into many different communities, we found these issues were not exclusive to one individual or group of people. Next. Thank you. We also identified concerns about what items and media are being collected and conserved. Who is making these decisions and what biases exist in the decision making process? So, we asked ourselves should collection and conservation still be at the core of a museum practice and perception? Additionally, we ask 
what resources are necessary or key to the development of the museum and its content. Financial and material resources are generally considered, but what about the people of the museum as a resource? What about the people outside the museum, the neighborhoods, and the members of its external community? Our interviewers also question the accessibility of a museum and their collections. Is the context accessible to everyone? Is some or all the context accessible everywhere? Is a museum accessible to the neighborhoods and surrounding community? Some people also felt that museums were boring, that they cost too much, and that they didn't fit to the self-defined stereotype mold of who visit the museums. Many also felt underrepresented by the type of content that the museum were displayed. Some of these issues may be difficult to solve for our last long-established museums, but that doesn't mean that changes can be made or that there are museums and organizations that are looking to change perception and disrupt the part. Next, please. Following, we did an analysis of museums that are taking actions and disrupting the paradigms by making museums more relevant and approachable for the neighborhoods and community. Next, please. We chose one to represent here today. The topic was the useful museum, which lecture was made by Alistair Hudson, director of the Middle Spread Institute of Modern Art in the United Kingdom. Here he introduced Middle Spread as a forgetting place which has no marking, no marking value, so there were no people left behind in the town due to the migration. So it became a relocation center for the Migration Control Center and a place for major communities. Because of its complexities, the model of a museum in this kind of place does not work. Next, please. Thank you. Then he was looking how to make art work, and he found in John Ruskin, who said, art should be a part of a social change. So Hudson was trying to resurrect the museum by the guy, by this guy, and taking the principle that a happy society is a productive society. For this, they make a committee which turned the museum into the Museum of Arte Util, or Useful Art, and introduced the term Museum 3.0. Next, please. To clear this term, it is important to speak a bit of the vision and the history he followed. He defined the first identity of museum as Museum 1.0 as a Victorian model where people display objects just for others to see. The second identity of the museum, Museum 2.0, as the 90s great art where people can engage, but in the end is someone's, someone else's agenda. So the new term, Museum 3.0, will be a place where museums and society contribute as one. Next, please. To deliver that, they established the next main point. Identify the history of the town, show crowd source, allow people to build during the show and not just a final presentation. Learning to making, have a studio where people can do and learn again. Here they used Pottery in this case, so they feel relatable to the history of the town. Allow people to choose what is displayed and have exhibition made by that community. Next, please. From all this, what we took as a relatable to our challenge was the recampaign of concepts. As he followed John Ruskin with art should be used for social change, we took the inspiration and believe it is time to give a usable value of nature for interconnection of museums and community. Next, please. To continue, I would like to briefly introduce the concept of bio inspiration or biomimicry. What is it and how does it factor into our process solution? Next. Thank you. Let me read a quick definition from the biomimicry resource handbook. Biomimicry is learning from and then emulating natural forms, processes, and ecosystems to create more sustainable design. Next, please. So here we focus on what would nature do here? How it would confront our challenge? What can we learn from the nature to introduce into social patterns? Next, please. These and all the questions asked during the process are focused on this natural approach. As we support is based on nature as a mentor, nature as a model, and nature as a master. So now I pass the word to my friend right now. It's for Newton. So when we started uh, looking at the challenge, uh, we saw museums and we saw community and we saw information as the link between both. 
Uh, so we looked at information in terms of learning and dissemination for the museums and in terms of knowledge and production for the community. When we started looking at uh, learning, uh, we looked, we delved into several organisms and then uh, we ended up with only the mycelium. We focused on the mycelium. Why? Because it's uh, holistic and it's comprehensive. And uh, in the mycelium, we started asking all these biomimetic questions about what, how, why, when, where, to what end, to come up with the mechanisms and the strategies. And from there, we reached to the um, forest ecosystem. Okay. And uh, when we reached the forest ecosystem, we realized that that's what inspired uh, the concept of symbiosis. Conceptually, the forest starts with a seed. The individual seed, uh, it grows and it actually wants to reach upwards toward the sun. While it's trying to go upwards, it's also rooting itself into the soil. While it's also going upward, it's becoming leaves and uh, the leaves become a tree to concentrate uh, the carbon in the air using the sun energy and the photosynthesis and to grow more. In the meanwhile, the roots are under the soil are becoming are growing and becoming a network. The question is why? Obviously, the tree also needs more nutrients from the soil, the NPK, the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And uh, the tree alone cannot uh, obtain these uh, nutrients in their basic forms. It cannot, it cannot extract them. So what happens is that it uh, looks for alliances and alliances with whom then, or with whom? Turns out that there's also the fungus uh, network, which is the mycelium, that's also, hold on, let me get the pointer. Okay, so the mycelium, which is the fungus uh, root network, is also creating a whole network under the soil, but it's, since it's a fungus, it's um, parasitic in its nature. So what it does, that it actually mobilizes the insects to um, dissolve or to, to extract the nutrients from the topsoil and to use them. Now, when the while the trees need uh, these nutrients, the fungus need uh, the carbon, the sugar concentrated from the trees. So that's where the exchange happens. And the exchange usually happens between, between both the fungus network root network and the tree's root network under the soil at the root ends of both, which is the hyphae. So this alliance between both uh, results into trees, forest, uh, with all kinds of components that fosters different kinds of organisms. To understand what is this alliance and what, is, what are these relationships, we look into all the contributors and the components of this. Uh, so there are the, under the ground, there are the community of decomposers or insects. There are all this network of roots and there are all the nutrients that are uh, dissolved uh, through the, uh, with, the comp with the decomposition. And then above the ground, there are also the nutrients in the air. There's the air uh, with the different skins uh, or atmospheres, um, there's the energy, and then there's also uh, the temperature, the seasons that stimulate the different growth. So from there we, we understand that uh, while there's the ground and above the ground where the structure happens and which is the forest in that sense, what we admire, what we appreciate, but this entire structure is a resultant of an, a whole lot of action that's happening below ground, the infrastructure, and uh, all together um, decide what happens above the ground, decide on this growth. And these questions actually stimulate the other kind of questions, the what, where, who, whom, when, in our, uh, in the abstract form, in the museum form, to decide how does a museum communicate with its neighbors. And in a more, a little bit more detailed, in the network of, uh, below ground also, there are all these nodes and interconnections 
that also a lot, of, a lot happens in terms of exchange. Moreover, that this uh, underground network uh, of roots, it grows horizontally because everything is mostly in the topsoil, but it also happens that the width of this uh, network also informs the height of the above structure. That also means that we need to question um, in terms of structures, size, and what kind of actions, interactions, and reactions need to happen, what kind of information, and what are these nodes and intersections. Now I pass it to Hannah. Thank you. Um, so in translating the biology, we identified the key elements of the forest ecosystem and how they could be interpreted in a social context. Next slide, please. Um, for instance, the trees um, we interpreted to be the museums. And next are the leaves where information can be processed. Information is a broad term that we use to describe artifacts, cultural practices, ideas, and anything else that has been or is being created and exchanged. The information processed in the leaves is generally coming from external sources like neighborhoods and communities and processed somewhere in the museum. In nature, photosynthesis is the process of transforming one kind of energy to another. As a result of photosynthesis, the leaves produce sugar and oxygen. In social terms, this energy is information, and as defined before, um, is transformed to generate a new form of information. For a museum, this could be the reorganization of information presented as exhibits or hosting events and workshops to create community engagement and exchange ideas. But this can't happen without a connection to external neighborhoods and communities. Next slide, please. Yeah. Which is where, where mycelium comes into play. Mycelium is the vegetative part of a fungus that consists of a network of small branching tubes. Because the mycelium is often found on and in soil, it connects to the plants via the plant's roots. Mycelium can be understood to be part of the social infrastructure, which includes the neighborhoods and communities. These points of connection for the trees and the mycelium are wherever the museums and neighbors and communities connect be it at the museum, in the community, or even virtually. The nutrients and the water that are transferred at these connection points are coming from the tree, but also from the soil and environment absorbed by the hyphae or small tubes of the mycelium. Because the mycelium is more efficient at absorbing water and nutrients from the soil than trees, a symbiotic or mutually beneficial relationship is established with the trees to exchange the nutrients and water. So the nutrients from the soil can be understood as ideas and information of the world that enter the social infrastructure along with people who are represented by water. The people carry these ideas and information through the neighborhoods and communities and exchange these ideas and information with museums. Which brings us to our concept. Next slide, please. So, with our concept, we are developing a nature-inspired social innovation guidebook for museums to engage with their neighbors and communities on a symbiotic basis to address these issues of accessibility and representation and to achieve the co-creation of social value. This guidebook will include three sections, the first of which is a section about symbiotic relationships and social value, what these terms mean and how they can be created and developed. The next section is for museums to reflect on their current relationship with neighbors and communities and use the ecosystem template we are developing to give intangible social concepts a tangible model. The final section is related to the integration of life's principles and will act as an audit for museums to identify how sustainable their current practices and goals are and to help determine what sustainable principles are important to the museum. Using the forest ecosystem graphics and the translation of biology into social terms, museum employees can begin a discussion about the key points of the social ecosystem, specifically the relationship of museums to their neighbors and communities. We will now demonstrate an exercise from the guidebook. Next slide, please. So the question we'll start with is where does the transfer of nutrients occur in the forest ecosystem? So this occurs in our example between trees and mycelium, where the nutrients that are gathered or produced are exchanged at points where the tree's roots connect to the mycelium. Next slide, please. So 
one second, please. Uh, translated, these connection points are where the museum connects to the neighbors and communities and where both transfer ideas and information. The question for museums then becomes, can you identify these points of transfer between your museum and your neighbors and communities? Where are these points of connection? The museum could be considered a point where information and ideas are transferred, but are there any points in the neighborhood or community that the museum is connected to? Are these connections established with, the, with organizations like community or cultural centers or schools? Are these connections in person and or virtual? How do these connections evolve over time? As we said earlier, we can't determine the answers to these questions, but we hope that the activities provided in the guidebook will aid museums in developing their connection to the neighbors and communities. Next slide, please. So our motivation to pursue projects like these uh, can be identified also in three parts. We believe that nature is an ultimate mentor and humans and their artifacts primarily originated and evolved in nature. With time, many humans lost their internal connection to nature and we have the dedication and passion to regain that original connection. In practicing and deepening this connection, we are concerned about the environment and not only the natural environment, but also the built and social environments that we all share. Learning from nature and its millennia of evolutionary problem solving means we are open to new ways of addressing problems. And in addressing these problems from new angles, we can act on issues related to sustainable social change, including the creation and development of highly connected functional communities. Next slide, please. So uh, what and who supports us in this project? We definitely go to nature for support because it has been problem solving and evolving for 3.8 billion years. But not only does nature draw um, from a deep well of knowledge, but we have the we've had the opportunity to work with and receive support from several experts of biomimicry um, and museum development communities. These experts include Diane Druby and Sandro Devino from We Are Museums, who connected with the Biomimicry Academy to propose projects like this one and met with us regularly to develop this project, and Asha Singhal, who acted as an advisor with knowledge of both the museum and biomimicry worlds, and from the Biomimicry Academy, Arndt, Fabian, and Paul, who guided us through the process of creating and developing a biomimetic concept. Next slide, please. Moving forward, we will continue to develop this guidebook and hope to start testing the exercises with museums in the near future. Next slide, please. In addition to receiving feedback and developing the guidebook with museums, we would be interested in hosting workshops with museums to work with them through the process. We would also be interested in aiding in the creation and development of information transfer points, be it physical and virtual locations, and or events to get museums and communities co-creating and talking about their issues. This concept has the potential for widespread social application and our team looks forward to working with anyone interested in applying the concept in new social contexts. Thank you. Well, thank you, first of all. But an, what an awesome presentation. And I can, uh, yeah, can only repeat what, uh, what also the, the people in the chat um, here probably to this presentation said already, what an awesome project and the great, um, great work. So uh, thank you very much. And um, yeah, we talked about already there are people standing by to use this guidebook that you want to develop in their consultancy and uh, museum related work. So um, yeah, this, uh, the, the floor is open for questions. We received plenty of questions online. We do not have time to answer or to ask them all, but um, maybe let me start with a question. Where did you draw your inspiration from? So is that, um, is that mainly literature search or um, how was your connection to the biological hands-on research? So um, we definitely started by looking, um, looking online with Ask Nature and reading several books. It was mostly um, sifting through information generally online um, to kind of understand our, our process a bit better and, um, and what we were going for. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. Hello? Hello? Yes. Hello. Diane. <laughs> okay. 
So maybe I can, this is Arndt speaking, I can add also, um, the inspiration was sort of manifold, and that was also uh, what the teams enjoyed, but also brought the teams to such a depth of uh, science and biological inspirations. First of all, we were working in collaboration with the Natural History Museum in Berlin. So we actually had two of our in-person sessions, the most critical ones, at their museum. So we were able to go through the exhibitions. We had guides from the museum to address certain questions, to focus their tours uh, for certain purposes. Then we had advisors and scientists, specialists who helped with uh, certain topics. And uh, finally, we also, and the teams actually did an amazing job in not only looking into Ask Nature, asknature.org, which is a, a database of uh, basically uh, case studies and biological principles curated by the Biomimicry Institute in the US, but they also really went into academic research and scientific papers, which again came from our scientific community, also from our history, Fabian and Mainz from science. So we had really a diversity of access points to get deep into research and biology. Okay, thank you very much. Um, another question online um, that is more maybe conceptual when talking about biomimicry, but I'd like to hear your opinion now as um, the upcoming biomimicry specialists um, or experts here. Um, where do you see the most value of biomimicry? Is it uh, rather in the technological application or in social innovation like you worked on? Um, or in our approach? Go ahead. Well, in, in general, but that question was asked during your presentation. Oh, okay. Do, do you want to answer or should I answer? <laughs> no, no, go ahead. Um, so for us, we obviously focused on the social aspect. Um, there were discussion, discussions regarding the technological aspects as well, um, but we didn't focus on them as much. Um, there are other uh, relevant projects happening now. We are just a part of a larger project um, and that the other parts of the project could be uh, focusing more on the tech technological side. But I mean, it goes both ways. Um, it's, there's obvious social applications with our research, but there are definitely technological ones as well. If, if I can add, Hannah, I think that at the end, do you hear me? Yeah, I think that at the end, it doesn't matter which part. Uh, I will, as we said in our concept, we or our motivation. Things why we're we doing this is for the environmental concert, not just as nature, but what's happening. But at the end, you can see that both projects, one is technical, one is social. At the end, both end with great results. So that's why we're trying to do these things. And I think that's why everyone here is. But also your question, when you ask about technological, do you ask about the physical uh, form or technology in terms of communication and media? Um, well, this question was asked by Carlos Dulanto online. So yeah. if, if you are with us, Carlos, you can, you can add to that question. Otherwise, um, I think uh, what, what Sylvia said in the end um, was, was quite telling. It's that um, there is no or, uh, uh, or either or. There is, uh, there's always an interplay between social innovation and technology. And this is exactly also where the strength of biomimicry is because we address it from different, different sides and uh, we can address maybe the same function with a technological solution, but also with the social innovation. Uh, do you want to add something there? Uh, no, uh, I just wanted to actually say that uh, while you, when you start in the social, even when you start in the social uh, research uh, or social biomimicry, it informs the form. And that's what um, we were trying to show is that, yes, we started uh, on a social level or in a community, but it also tells you that the form is uh, constructed by the net the social network uh, the social aspects uh the the symbiosis in turn as a concept how far can it go it also tells you uh, how big can you grow and uh, there was a lot uh when we delved into the research there was a lot about the whole issue of growth and uh what informs growth and what's the limit of growth 
and um, it's it's very philosophical but growth is also physical and um, that can apply to buildings and the museums in particular uh, in a neighborhood for example stuff like that but that requires further research anyhow well, yeah, and what you see is what what we also have seen from the other presentation before is that uh, you never you never stop asking the questions, right? And what you found out is um, yes, yeah, the food for for further development and uh, like going down from levels of asking like is a museum really a physical space? That was a question that you were dealing with a lot, um, and and which kind of communication um, well concepts uh, could replace physical. Uh, so I would like to use the last five minutes to open up the Biomimicry Academy online platform. As we've heard in the introduction, the responsible innovation education in the academy comprises of four pillars and starts with human-centered design, with the design thinking process, and more generally speaking, the double diamond. The center at core of the whole education is based on the biomimicry and nature inspired innovation process and framework. Um, and it leads over towards systems thinking and the most practical approach to it is the circle economy, which, which combines biomimicry with uh, business modeling on the other side, on the other, on the other end. Now in the business section in the last part, we integrate all these learnings and the concepts into actual application on the market or in social innovation um, with the frameworks of exponential organizations, this classical business modeling um, that leads towards communication and um, community integration. I'd like to mention that we operate in a global network of uh, biomimicry and um, nature inspired and research institutions most prominently the European Biomimicry Alliance, the Biomimicry Institute in the US, um, the Natural History Museum here in Berlin, and of course uh, the center of all our activities, the brain and people power of Biomimicry Germany. Now the Biomimicry Practitioner Online Essentials is the training program that part of the Biomimicry Practitioner training that is completely online and self-paced. It comprises of three modules. The first module uh, consisting of three chapters and uh, having a learning content of um, about 30 hours total, which you can go through in a self-paced manner. And we open up this module today. The second module has again three, sep three, three chapters with the same setup and leads from um, human-centered design and biomimicry over to systems thinking, to circle economy, and then apply by mimicry to its challenge. We open up this module one month later in May 4, 2020. And finally, the third module consists of two chapters, um, the first one being uh, business modeling, and the second one um, having uh, to one aspect uh, or addressing aspects of communication um, and go-to-market processes and, and skills. Um, but also community integration. And we open this again one month later at 1st of June. It's not only an education program and you are not left alone. What Biomicro Academy is a platform um, having add-on courses, but also a mentorship program. So join our weekly office hours when you participate in the academy or when you have questions um, that you would like to have answered before you start the academy. Now, the online essentials are the entry points into the Biomimicry Practitioner Certification Program, and the second part of this program is the project training. It will be online as well, but having on-site aspects that are optional and add certain uh, benefits of uh, doing research on-site to and, and the immerse into nature and uh, to connect to the community in Berlin. Now, this second part of the program is meant really for entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs and social innovators in general. And it goes from scoping your own goal and research your users in the first 
place to create sustainable solutions using the human centered design and the biomimicry process and everything you've learned in the online essentials uh, to finally create your business and uh, take your ideas e even either um, towards pitching them in a company or bringing it to the market and communicate it and come up come out with a marketable minimal viable product now two things i'd like to mention on top of this is that um, we will set up a biomicore academy global philanthropy program coming up in april 2020 and um, we want to not only uh, have make the biomicore um, apl applied uh, program available in europe or in the western uh, countries by um, by charging a certain amount that is uh, that is reasonable in, in these areas, but you also want to make the uh, program available to countries, especially of the global south. And um, for this, we couple the pay for the program to the GDP of the country. So this is coming up in April, and we'll update you on our channels, on our social media channels, and on Barmuk Academy and the newsletter. Now. Um, Secondly, I'd like to address that um, attached to the biomimicry practitioner education and the academy is our co-creation platform, Cobiome, where we use a global network and a, a digital co-creation platform to solve challenges from social innovation, so non-profit challenges, but also especially from, from businesses who want to become sustainable and innovate responsibly. Um, graduates from the Bionic Academy automatically enter into this pool of experts who can co-create on the platform. And if you want to know more, follow Cobiome on the social media ch channels. Um, now, I'd like to mention in this respect that we follow the principles of the Radical Collaboration Manifesto of the Responsible Innovation Network. And if you want to know more about this, so the, the foundations and the statutes of, um, of cooperation instead of competition in business and in all innovation that we do then uh, check out this website that is linked up here on, on you or you can use the qr code so finally there's nothing more to say but um, please visit www.biomimicryacademy.com and if you are interested in attending one of our courses um, make make use of your, ten, your attendance to this webinar by using the, uh, the voucher um, hashtag webinar 2020-64, uh, secure your 20% discount. So with this, I'd like to thank you again for your participation. I'm looking forward to seeing you again during our training program.